Hi guys, this is a long plane review for Shadow of the Beast on the Amstrad CPC, released by Gremlin Graphics in 1990. Now this is a conversion of the Cynosis original released on the Amiga in 1989. And if you want to get an idea for how the Amiga version looked and sounded, check out this stunning demo from a logon system for the Amstrad Plus computers called Eerie Forest. I've captured this on the uh, Amstrad WinApe emulator, but you can watch this on a real Amstrad 464 Plus, 6128 Plus, or indeed the GX4000 console. Now, the Amiga original was of course famous for its stunning graphics, presentation, atmospheric music from the always excellent David Whittaker, now writing for 16-bit machines, and especially for the many levels of parallax scrolling. You can see some here in action. Uh, the Amiga game was released a year earlier in 1989, as I mentioned earlier, to much hype, fanfare, and adulation in the press at the time. But, and there's a big but, it was also notorious for its frustrating difficulty and rather old fashioned and lacking gameplay. Most reviewers at the time overlooked that, instead, being wowed by its appearance. But this is definitely a game and a case of style over substance. All fur coat and no knickers. Uh, okay, but here you go. You can see here, guys, um, this is actually fairly close to the Amiga graphics, a little bit blockier, not quite as smooth parallax scrolling on the um, clouds there. But if you've never seen the Amiga original or heard what it sounds like, this is actually pretty close to it. So there we go. But this wasn't the only attempt at making a demo of Shadow the Beast on the Amstrad. Indeed, check out this earlier, and I think more impressive demo for the standard range of Amstrad CPC machines, simply called Shadow of the Beast Preview from Overflow. And that is very, very impressive for the, basically, uh, for the basic Amstrad CPC computers. In fact, that parallax scrolling is actually a little bit smoother than the version we just saw. Special note should be made of the Roger Dean artwork on the box. Uh, Cynosis used him for a lot of games and previously he was most well known for doing the album covers for prog rock band Yes. And there's the adverts for the game and the press. And we're going to start off with the Amstrad version, the actual conversion from Gremlin Graphics in 1990, a year later. A uh, fairly okay loading screen there. And we should get um, a bit of the story here. With some lovely atmospheric music. As the mist clears, the eerie image of a forest forms in front of you. To the east, a vast plain extends towards the horizon. Westward, however, in the thick of the forest, this is, I think, a hint of where to go, actually, in the next level, a thousand pairs of eyes pierce the mist, glaring despondently back at you. And that might have been a hint to actually go west when we start the game up. And indeed, you want to go to the left, i.e. west rather than east first. Most people are, are by instinctively um, go right at the start of a game, don't you? Uh, but actually, <laughs> this trolls you a bit. Actually, you want to go left. Uh, if you go right, you'll come to a well. That's um, when you go down the well, it's locked, and you need a key, and you can only open it from the other side. And further to the east or right um, is a castle. Well, that's for a like later section and level. But lovely music here. Uh, we have one level of parallax scrolling. Was it two? Would you call it? With the uh, bottom section being to parallax. But we don't get a parallax scrolling uh, clouds in the background or, anything, or trees or anything like that. And why did I just randomly take damage there? Anyway, you've got to find this tree and go inside. And we get more of a story. Uh, there's occasionally a few uh, frame drops in this recording because it is uh, like a nearly an hour long video. So I do apologize for that. Not much I can do about it, but I'm not going to uh, re-record. Yeah, it, I'll let you read that yourselves rather than me read it out. 
Um, I will go through the backstory of the game just after this. And then I'll talk you through the levels and other bits and bobs. We've got a lot to talk about, but it's a very, very long video. <laughs> nice to have these little cutscenes, though. Obviously, static screens, but they're actually drawn really nicely. And here we go. Right. Okay, let's go for... Let's tell you about the story of the game, then. Now, the backstory in the actual manual for the Amstrad and Specky is pretty long-winded and too much to read out here. Otherwise, you guys would be falling asleep. Oops! Took damage there. Um, but essentially, uh, you play as the warrior who used to be human and his father was killed by the Temple Masters as a sacrifice to the Beast, who you swear to seek out and kill for vengeance. Now, the Amstrad manual doesn't tell us why he's no longer human and how he, was, he became this beast or creature or whatever. Which looks like a cross between uh, a xenomorph and a predator and uh, God knows what. Um, but the, the Amiga manual does tell us. Uh, apparently his human name was Arbron. A-A-R-B-R-O-N. Uh, and when he was young he was enslaved by the priests of the Beast Lord or Temple Masters, as the Amstrad Manual tells us, and was fed drugs to destroy his will and turn him into the Beast Messenger. He's called the Warrior in the Amstrad version. Anyway, Beast Messenger then, serving the Beast itself, which is actually named here as Mailtoth. Mailtoth. M-A-L-E-T-O-T-H. The Beast Lord. Anyway, it was his own father's sacrifice and death he witnessed that broke the power of the drugs and now here we are, off to find the beast and seek vengeance. So, um, I will call this like part two. We just did part one, which is very simple. Walk left and go go to the tree of the door. Part two, here, we have to go uh, find a key. Then we have to go find a monster tossing a ball in the air. Ugh. And you have to punch the ball to get the weapon. Um, but you must apparently do this after the key. Collecting the key after getting the weapon makes you lose the weapon, which makes the game completely impassable. Um, also, we'll find a teleport nearby. We actually saw it a, couple, a few screens back, and which will save you a bit of time, and then we get to a big skeleton monster mechanical thing, which uh, we have to destroy with the weapon. Without the weapon, as I said, you'll be stuck and you'll die there. I think the key's right here. There's the key. And just follow my route, guys. Um, I think this bottle gives us... Oh, it restored our energy there. So we've got 12 uh, maximum bits of health there. You can see in the top left there, just left of the uh, Beast lo uh, logo. And it's precious, and I really should have taken damage there. So now we're off to find the weapon, uh, which is a big beastie tossing a ball in the air, <laughs> believe it or not. It's not exactly a huge map, um, so it's fairly easy to map for yourself. There are maps available online on the CPC Power website. I preferred someone's made a, an entire map from screenshots of the game. Oh, there's the teleporter there that'll be very useful. Uh, on uh, so there's a full map made of the ZX Spectrum version, which is basically uh, pretty much identical to the Amstrad one. So go on the World of Spectrum site and get that map. That helped me greatly in beating this game. And it's a game that I've been meaning to do for years, but I kind of put it off because I f personally I find the game a bit sort of monotonous and boring. But we'll come on to that in a bit. Well, here's the uh, the beast we were talking about a minute ago. It's pretty easy. Just punch the ball that he's uh, bouncing in the air there, throwing in the air, uh, and time yourself between his uh, flame blasts. Nice flashing effects there when you actually punch the ball. There we go, now we've got the weapon. And we can now go on and defeat the monster of this uh, level. So, uh, initial thoughts. Um, I quite like the Mode 1 graphics. They're, they're very, very detailed and uh, gloomy and eerie colours being used. Especially when you go inside this like cave system or whatever. 
Well, it's very, very bare bones. There's like no background. It's just a one plain colour. Uh, the rest of it is fairly detailed and nice, but... Um, oh, disc glow. Oh, actually, that boss actually looks rather impressive. And now we've got this block uh, blocking our way. So if we didn't have the weapon, we would have been stuck here forever and ever and ever. And actually, this is a fairly easy boss because all he does is just move left and right. But yeah, detailed sprites and like detailed like bosses and and what little there is of the background graphics is rather nice and detailed. It's just we've just got a one big plain colour in the background there and yeah, makes it look feel very sparse and barren. If it wasn't for the music, guys, this game would have just been totally dull. But I think with the excellent, excellent music and special mention has to be made of the music. Here, I think converted by Ben Daglish from um, David Whittaker's original Amiga soundtrack. Interesting that David Whittaker didn't do it himself, uh, but got Ben Daglish to do it. But it's absolutely excellent, and it really creates a, a wonderful atmosphere in the game. Makes things feel really eerie and gloomy. Quite downbeat, really, but it does really suit the atmosphere of the game. And if it wasn't for this, the music, this game would have been really, really dull. It does the, the music really is quite it's immersive. It, dra it draws you into the game and the story. And if it wasn't again for the cutscenes, telling you bits of the story and stuff like that, that all helps. It all helps draw you in and keep you playing the game as you want to progress and find out more about this character's progression or whatever. Although, to be fair, the story is pretty limited in what it tells you as you progress. Okay, so let's call this uh, part three, uh, or level three. Now we've got to go and find a switch and punch it. And in the section above the switch, there's uh, an, an area above the switch, there's another key to collect. And then we've got to go and find a potion bottle, and I believe this gives you a more powerful punch that will allow you to defeat the dragon monster guarding the bottom of the well and the exit back to the outside world. And one of the two keys will open the well door. And once we're in the outside world, then we're going to go find the castle. Right, uh, okay. Um, so this conversion was done by Spidersoft. Oh god, I'm losing way too much energy here. I should have uh, tried it, maybe restarted, but I've already got quite far into the game. Oh, there's the key. And I think the switch will be nearby. I think it's just below, actually. Uh, so the conversion was done by Spidersoft, which is apparently uh, two guys called Steve Marsden and Dave Cook. I don't know if both were coders or one did graphics or they both coded and someone else unlisted did the graphics. But um, they've done a pretty good job here, to be fair. Uh, now, this is according to the CPC Power website, and it's sometimes wrong there. But I'm also struggling to find where they found this info. So, could be wrong, could be completely different people, who knows. Uh, but Steve and Dave of Spidersoft apparently also worked on Amsha Games uh, Technician Ted, City, Sick uh, City Slicker, Time Scanner, Supercars, that was pretty good. Uh, that was also for Gremlin. Uh, Ninja Spirit, and most interestingly, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, one of the rarest games on the Amstrad, and one of the last releases by US Gold. As and as mentioned earlier, music was apparently converted by the legendary Ben Delgleish from the legendary David Whittaker's Amiga score. And there's the switch. It says, "Don't touch," but we're we're gonna do that. I think, uh, what does that do? I think it opens up the passage to the boss at the end of this level, but, yeah. I didn't get that, f I didn't go and test what, you, how far you can get without knocking that switch, so whatever, just find the switch and punch it. Um, okay, what else to mention? Um, as you can see guys, oh, what will that give us? That's an energy restore, so look for the chests as well. Um, punch the chests and there'll be some other objects on the outside world like stone monuments and crosses which you can punch and that will restore your energy but some of the stone crosses which you'll see on a lot on a later level 
will also take away energy, so it's a bit harsh that. <laughs> um, yeah guys, um, it is a bit of a plod this game, there are long sections of nothing much happening. And then it kind of goes a bit crazy with overdoing it with enemies and stuff. Uh, enemies are not particularly intelligent, they just kind of move in a set uh, pattern and direction towards you or whatever. But I think a really frustrating section is coming up shortly with these things. Right, there is no way of predicting and knowing where these like snake monster things will come out of the ground at you. I seem to do best if I just sort of utch forward a bit and move slowly forward bit by bit. Oh. Need needlessly took damage there and <sighs> honestly if you get unlucky there oh I got lucky there actually uh, if you get very very unlucky here you can pretty much die there and uh, they'll drain all your you could easily lose all your energy points there there's a section there's a longer section with more of them in a bit I think as well just to add to the frustration I absolutely detest those monsters that come out of the ground. I mean, all you need is some kind of visual clue, like the ground rumbling with some dirt flying, like like a split second or a second before the monster appears and takes and uh, causes damage to you. That would have helped matters there. Except that they are quite random. And uh, oh, watch out for the uh, giant wasp, I think it is, or hornet. Uh, so they're quite random, you can't predict where they're coming out of the ground at you and there's quite a few sections of that and that can take your energy from full ne down to next to nothing. Very very frustrating, I hate those sections. Uh, it seems to be a bit potluck if you can get through them or not. And by the way guys, if you lose all your energy it is game over, end game, back to the start. Oh god there's more of them. No continues, no lives. So. Um, yeah, if you've got this far, what are we nearly uh, 15 minutes into the actual game? Um, oh god, that'll be so dispiriting having to redo all this section again. So I do question like the longevity of the game. If you want to go through all that again. And again, not much happening now. But um, I think we should be coming to the boss very shortly. I don't know what I, what the hell was I doing there? Why didn't I jump? I thought I, I wouldn't be able to jump in this corridor, but you can't actually jump through the ceiling there. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, guys, there's also this like you know, there's no restart point, and as I said no lives to continue. You die really far into the game. And it's back to the start, leaving you wondering whether you can go through it all again. So it is off-putting in terms of replay value. Uh, these sections are just get randomly attacked over and over. Plus we've got beasts as well attacking us. Very, very annoying this bit. And my energy's my energy wasn't full, and now we're on like five bits of energy left. Ugh. And later on there's like enemies that will attack you from the ceiling like that too. Ugh, ugh. Yeah, quite. I think this is probably like the longest level. When we come to the castle, it isn't as isn't as big. I think. So once we get through this level, the other levels are a, a, sh a bit shorter than this one. Um, I can't imagine this is a great viewing. But hopefully you're sort of chilling out to the um, relaxing gameplay and atmospheric music. And it does appear to be quite a maze, but really there's not a great deal of places you can get lost, you know. There might be a, it might be an area where you've got like a choice of two ladders, you take one, follow that around, see where it goes to, you get to a dead end, come back down. Oh, I think that switch may have... Um, released an energy barrier there or something and now picked up the super potion there it's given given us a more powerful punch there we go so yeah you might hit a dead end and you come all the way back to where your um, 
path split in two then go the other way and yeah it's uh there's not many visual clues there's not much changes in scenery to, uh, to show that you're progressing apart from things like this we've got these flames coming down which we haven't seen before in the level so then we know where we kind of like roughly got to and we and i know that i'm on the right path to get to the end of level boss here but certainly guys if you want to defeat this game yourself there's maps on the uh, CPC Power and Wilder Spectrum site. Oh god it's those things again and I've only got four bits of energy left. Might have had a few frame drops on the video there, apologies guys but I'm not going to re-record all this again. <laughs> So I'm just just maybe going forward a bit. I find if you just keep running constantly, you will get hit over and over. I've tested it a few times, trying to find a pattern for those monsters coming out the ground, but meh. So here's the uh, the, the well boss, let's call him, the end of uh, part three. It's really, really easy. A bit like the, uh, the, the monster that was uh, tossing the ball in the air. But just go in, punch a few times, and move out of the way from his flame attack, and repeat and repeat. So... The bosses are pretty simple here. It's only really like the very final boss that actually kind of proves a bit of a problem. Mm, although the end of level castle boss actually throws three different fireballs at you which is like quite hard to dodge. God, we've got zero energy left, so one more hit and we're dead. But we've reached the end of part three. Hurrah, we've reached the well. And we can now open... What we, one of our keys has been used there. And we can now move to the outside again. All right, well, we'll read this. We'll read it this time. You emerge from the darkness into sunlight again. No music here, actually, weirdly. Um, however, it's late in the day and the shadows are growing longer. Bit of a slow scroll. It's also becoming uncomfortably warm. Oh, dear. Well, it doesn't really tell as much of the story there. A bit of a waste of time, but okay. Thank you for that little cutscene bit there. Oh, a few frame drops there. Sorry, guys. So I cannot get hit once here, we need to get to a power up, which I think we will get to one shortly. Now as I said earlier guys, um, the Amiga version was highly praised and oh there's some energy pickups there, brilliant, was highly praised and lauded for its stunning presentation, graphics and parallax scrolling. We get a little bit of parallax here, but the Amiga version was just like the, uh, the demo uh, we showed at the start of the video like multi levels of like clouds parallaxing and the bottom section and the trees and stuff like that um but yeah it kind of clouded most reviewers to the fact that its gameplay was pretty poor with very little to it and overly difficult and quite old-fashioned gameplay really more suited to an 8-bit computer like uh the Amsterdam Specky really um with the Amstrad though nowhere near the graphical power and capabilities of the Amiga, although that demo does show that it can do stuff like that, um, but hey, you know, we're talking about the days in the uh, 80s where pub uh, publishers and developers only had a few weeks to get a game done. Um, how on earth were Gremlin going to convert this when it relies so heavily on those graphics masking the gameplay issues? Because it was overly, overly difficult and frustrating game. Well. Gremlin, they've been wise in tweaking the gameplay accordingly, or rather Spidersoft have. It's nowhere near as tough or as frustrating as the Amiga version, and you can get quite far uh, each time on early playthroughs of the game. Also, it's probably wise they chose Mode 1 here to do the graphics. 
Uh, it means less colours, but we have more detailed sprites and backgrounds, we have better animation, and it runs quite smoothly. Uh, so a special note must go to these outdoor sections, where apart from the badly faded sky, which kind of looks a bit ugly with the stippling there, everything else looks splendid, and they've even managed to get some parallax scrolling there in the bottom section. What a shame though that once inside the caves and the castle, which we're coming to shortly, that the graphics are simplified even more and lacking in detail. Looks like the Psygnosis logo, that a monster attacking us there. <laughs> um, okay, so on this section here, yes, we are getting, uh, we're, we're trying to find the castle, which is over way to the right there. The monsters are a little bit more aggressive and more of them come at you. Uh, but, but, but before you go in the castle, make sure you pick up the torch to the right of the castle, otherwise you'll be in uh, gloomy pitch uh, darkness and blackness in the castle. And this outdoor section does go on a bit, actually. So by now, the game is feeling really repetitive. So it's, it has kind of addressed the gameplay issues of the Amiga version. And um, just tone down the difficulty and the frustrating barrage of enemies that it's so difficult to avoid and uh, defend and deflect or whatever. But there's very, there seems to be very little going on, very little change in the actual gameplay. It feels actually quite an old fashioned game for a game that should have been uh, one to really stand out and sell the Amiga and then you know, be ported to the Amstrad and show off its capabilities too, but oh well. It's still a fairly relaxing, enjoyable romp, if that's your kind of thing. Now we may as well talk about the other versions of the game. Um, so this um, got ported to a lot of computers and consoles and stuff. Shadow the Beast uh, arrived on the Amiga and then was ported to the Atari ST, Amstrad of course, as we're watching here, Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, Sega Mega Drive, Sega Master System, uh, Atari Lynx, FM Towns and Turbo Graphics CD. Um, there was also a, NES, uh, sorry, a SNES version made, Super Nintendo version, called, <laughs> unsurprisingly, Super Shadow of the Beast, but apparently um, had difficulty getting approval from a Nintendo for a, for a uh, release. Remember, it had to all games had to go to Nintendo for their seal of quality and approval and all that crap. Oh, here's the castle. Um, and in the end, the uh, SNES version it never materialised. However, you can find leaked ROMs online. Oh, don't go in the castle yet. Go right and get the torch. Jump to get it there. There we go. That's on the castle ramparts. And yeah, just show you can't go any further to the right there now. And now we can go in the door here. I'm going to talk about um, uh, how this version compares to other versions in a minute. But I'll read this up. Behind the heavy oak, heavy oak door, a dark passage leads through a guard room to a wider set of corridors. Ahead, you can make out a T junction in the passage passages the air is thick with moisture lovely thank you very much for that <laughs> okay go left from the start here and go up um we're inside the castle top right of the castle is a load of chests with health but most importantly the spanner uh, it's not entirely clear what the spanner is for, but I think in the Amiga version it's used on a box to disable electric or lightning strikes in a certain corridor. Here I think it's just used automatically to turn them off as you move, uh, but you need to get the spanner basically. Um, and then in the bottom, far bottom left of the castle is a chest containing a weapon. It's actually a gun, which you actually carry and shoot. Um, and once you have the gun, you need to go and find the three-headed dragon and kill it. And that's the end of the castle level. And things get quite tough in here with acid drops from the ceiling. Okay, so other versions of the game then. Um, 
I think here we're just going to talk about the CPC's main rivals because there's a lot of different versions of the game. The Specky and C64. Now the ZX Spectrum version is identical in every way to the CPC apart from it's only in two colours compared to the, uh, the amateur CPC's four colours here. Although for large parts of it, it looks like it's only using about three colours. But anyway, I'm on the Amstrad. <laughs> um, uh, the Specky version, I think, uh, may run very, 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 very slightly, and I mean very, 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 very slightly uh, faster. But if it does, it's so minuscule I can barely tell even with running uh, both side by side. Regardless with the extra colours, the CPC wins here. Um, has it? Specky version has the same music and cutscenes and ending and all that kind of stuff. Oh, here we are, top right in the castle. Uh, bust those chests open for bonus health. There we go. Nearly at full health now. Brilliant. And clip the spanner all the way over to the right, but watch out for the randomly appearing um, acid drops. I should have left that chest to get to do on the way back because I might have taken a bit of damage. And also, enemies actually spawn in the same locations every time, so you could learn the layout of enemies in this game and try and predict when they come. But, oh God, this, <laughs> these levels are so long and a bit tedious that like, you're never really going to remember them. But you might remember that the bat will spawn just before the spanner or something like that. But we've got the spanner that will deactivate an energy gate later on and lightning strikes in a corridor and that will allow us to get to the boss. But first now, we've got to go and find the weapon in the bottom left of the castle. Um, okay, Commodore 64 version of the game. Okay, well, this is different. Um, first thing to mention of the Commodore version is that it's not a Gremlin graphics release. Um, indeed, it's actually an ocean release uh, in conjunction with Cynosis. And apparently DMA Design did the conversion work. And it was uh, only released on cartridge, and I believe only cartridge, and not disc or tape. Uh, I can't seem to find anything online about whether a tape or disc version exists or not. Um, so maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but I can only find uh, it released for the Commodore cartridge. God, I wonder how this plays on the, uh, what was it, the GS console. C4, oh, forget the name of it. Anyway, that, that crappy Commodore console that was like pretty rival to the uh, GX4000. Anyway, um, anyway, um, <laughs> the Commodore 64 version uh, tries to be more like the, the Amiga original and has some very, very impressive multi layers of parallax scrolling and plays at a very smooth and very fast speed. So, Actually, though, it ends up just being like the Amiga version. Visually, very impressive, apart from maybe some blocky sprites. But it also suffers from the same gameplay defects, with it being overly difficult and frustrating. Indeed, by the time you go inside the cave system, or part two, I called it earlier, or the castle, and there's no more impressive imp uh, parallax scrolling happening, it just highlights uh, even more how weak the actual game is. So, in a way... Oh, actually, I didn't say... Nice spider sprites there, but they appear to be just floating in the air and not on a web or a thread. Anyway, um, so anyway, in a way, it's hard to say which is better out of the Amstrad and the Commodore 64 version. The C64 is most like the Amiga and very impressive too, whereas the CPC version doesn't even bother trying but is more enjoyable to play. So I'll leave it up to you guys to decide here which is better. And we're getting fairly close to the uh, the weapon pickup. I think it's just below us to the left. Oh yeah, I should point out as well. Um, Gremlin increased the price for this uh, game and release at the time. Normal retail uh, for full price Amstrad CPC games in 1990 was about 9.99 on cassette and 14.99 on disc. Shadow of the Beast, however, went for $12.99 on cassette and a whopping $15.99 on disc. Ouch. Um, makes you question really why they thought this was worth more money. But I guess they were hoping um, 
the hype of the Amiga version would be enough to uh, justify people desperate, desperate enough to pay extra for this game. Who knows? Anyway, we've got the weapon there. We've got a very frustrating corridor of acid drops, though. Grr. And uh, now we can make our way to the uh, boss of the castle. I'll come on to like, the basically the final sections of the game. I will say that the controls are tight and responsive. Um, there's no lag in the game that I've noticed, uh, really. And uh, if the controls weren't tight and responsive, it would have made a very frustrating game even more frustrating. <laughs> And pretty much unplayable. So well done, Spider Soft, in those regards. But I think the main thing of, the, of this game that sells it for me, guys, is the awesome music. It, the music is so good. I mean, it's a bit downbeat and dour, and I kind of prefer more upbeat kind of music. But it just suits the game and the eerie atmosphere really, really, really well. If it wasn't for the music, guys, it, it would have. I would have really marked this game down a, a huge amount. It's amazing what the difference some like great music can make to a game. Hmm. Okay. How far away are we from the monster? Uh. Oh, very. Oh, we're getting close. We're getting close. He's down to the right, bottom right there. Just have to work our way down these ladders and corridors. I have, to, I have had a look at the other versions briefly. Um, I wasn't very impressed by the Mega Drive version, I have to say. Oh, hang on, here's the, oh, we'll talk, hang on, here's, here's the three-headed dragon. Not getting any hits there. So, a little bit tougher than the other bosses we've seen in the game because there's three fireballs that come out. One straight down, one diagonally, and one uh, horizontally. So it's pretty easy, once you've seen it uh, a couple of times happen, to time yourself there. And again, just getting close, blast away with your weapon, instead of your fists this time, and then move away. There we go, job done. And now we're on to the penultimate level, hurrah! So we're going to call this level six, or part six, and... Uh, Wow, we have actually we've got a change of gameplay here, guys. Look, it's a scroll, a horizontally scrolling shoot 'em up now. Um, he's wearing a mask. He's still got the gun, and he's got something strapped to his back. Now, some people think we're underwater here, uh, but actually, we apparently now have some kind of jetpack. Because <laughs> uh, I had to go and have a look at the Amiga version, see what was going on there, like see if we're underwater or not. Because we have got sort of a a very very blue looking uh, screen now but no it's apparently a jetpack but we don't see any kind of flames coming at the bottom of it like we do on the Amiga version but finally a change of pace here just gotta time myself through these uh, lightning strikes or energy gates oh, God, I mistimed it doesn't need much time to get through them split second timing is needed there Uh, I suppose it's probably the most fun level in the game, maybe. Oh, shoot those! Shoot the rubble there to get an energy pickup. Yeah, I remember the Mega Drive version not being very good at all. Um, I think it was. Do you, I think it? Huh, I think it was even more harder and frustrating than the Amiga version. And and when they tried to convert it to PAL or NTSC, whatever, one of the versions plays accidentally way too fast to making it even even tougher and frustrating so probably want to avoid the Mega Drive version. The Master System version looks quite impressive to me as did the Atari Lynx. Trying to more emulate the arcade, uh, the um, uh, sorry the Amiga version but um, reducing things down looks quite impressive on those two 8-bit systems. Um, the FM Towns and the Turbo Graphics CD they look very very impressive though. Um, very very close to the Amiga version and I think it's the FM Towns version that actually looks and plays a bit better than the Amiga one. can't remember if it's the FM Towns or Turbo Graphics. I feel, I feel it's the FM Towns which is 
uh, people say is better than the Amiga. One of those two, but there we go. Lose, lost a lot of energy here though on this level. I really, really, really hate those things that come out the ceiling and the floor. Really, really hate them in this game. Just makes me go, ugh. And if I died and had to redo the game knowing I had to get past those sections where they come out the, the floor and the ceiling, from those snake monsters to the stalactites and stalactites or whatever they're called, it would really put me off coming back to this game. But thankfully I managed to get the long play done. <laughs> I think we're not far from the boss here. More, oh, is that more? Another energy pick up there. But now I've got full energy. Uh, let's have a look at talk about the magazine review scores at the time quickly. I think before the boss comes. This was reviewed in the December 1990 issue 63 of Amsterdam Action. They generally liked it, praising the graphics, music, and how they adjusted the gameplay compared to the Amiga version, which I talked about. However, criticised it for not having any restart points or lives, just like me, and questioned whether you'd continue to play it if you had to go through all the early parts of the game again. Yeah, again, just like me, it mirrors my feelings in this game. I think the boss is coming up here. And Amsterdam Action gave the graphics 90%. Wow. Sonic's 80%. A bit strange, considering how good the music and sound effects are here. Grab Factor 83%. Staying Power 85%. Which is a bit confusing given their main criticism of the game and its longevity. And they gave it an overall rating of 84% and an AA Rave Award. So there we go. Oh yeah, we defeated the boss quite quickly there. They didn't really get much chance to talk about it. Uh, another impressive looking boss there, guys. Um, he was actually a little bit tough as well. We took a bit of damage from him. So that's probably the most, uh, probably the best boss in the game in terms of Okay, it's not just like stood still and then firing a flame and he just moved back and forward to kill him. But, uh, but yeah. Um, okay, so we're now on the final level of the game. Part 7. The final section. Um, we just need to go right and kill the beast, basically. But make sure you have enough energy to do it. Punch the crosses there to get more energy, but I think one of them takes away energy. That took away energy! How rude! We had no idea, no way of knowing that would take away energy. I went from nine bits of energy to seven. <laughs> but yeah, um, but make sure you have enough energy when you reach the final boss because you're going to take some damage from him, guaranteed, pretty much. Uh, so you need at least three or four bits of health when you reach the beast. Or was it, or was it called Mail Top, isn't he, or something? Yes, the Beast Lord Mail Toff. Thank you, uh, the Amiga manual. Uh, my score, my review score, blimey, this is a hard game to score, really. I like the detailed graphics, and I, I like how they've changed the colours. We've got a bit of parallax on the go here as a nod to the Amiga original. It does play really smoothly at a consistent frame rate and a decent frame rate. The music is excellent, the sound effects are excellent too. Uh, there's plenty of game here, but there are some really frustrating sections and um, it's a bit of a plod at times with uh, long sections where nothing happens, then lots of sections where like we get a really annoying enemies like these spikes coming out the floor and I do question the longevity of the game. So as an overall score guys, um, Giving credit as well to the tight controls and they tweaked the gameplay to make it a, a lot more bearable than the Amiga version. Um, all things considered, I'll, I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. Just, just. I'm more, I'm kind of erring, erring towards a 7.5 out of 10. But I do know this game has its fans and people argue very strongly that it's a really, really good game. And there are people that absolutely hate it. Uh, so I'm just going to give it an 8 out of 10. I probably would have, if there's a percentage score, I would have given this maybe a 79%. But I've rounded it up. So I mark out of 10 normally on these videos. So there you go, guys. 8 out of 10 from me. And we should be coming to... Here's the boss. Here's the final boss, Mailtoff. And guys, just... He's got this tail with a big sort of thing at the end of it that 
that will crush you. He's so big, he's well off the other side of the screen. The best thing to do here, guys, is just punch away really, really madly. Don't try and avoid it because it moves too slowly. We actually get a bit of slowdown here for the first time. And you generally won't be able to avoid the thing dropping down on you. Oh, real slow down there and lag. But there we go. Just getting close and punch away madly with a few bits of energy left. And there we go. Congratulations. The ending. You have freed yourself from the shadow of the beast. We don't even get a little cutscene though after all those other cutscenes. So disappointing that we don't get an ending to the game. But there you go. Um, so there you go, guys. That is Shadow of the Beast. Um, I'll give this, uh, just give it an 8 out of 10. And um, not a bad product from Gremlin, but um, could have been a bit better, really. I would have liked to see this in Mode Nought and see what it would look like then with a few levels of parallax scrolling. And uh, I would have been all over this, despite uh, the kind of barren and bare bones gameplay. So, there we go guys, thank you very very much for watching, please like, comment, subscribe, check me out on Twitter, Facebook, I'm also on Twitch now, and I'm also on Patreon if you want to support what I'm doing, and uh, thank you for uh, all my patrons and everyone else who watches and does comments and stuff, thank you for your support. Cheers, and goodbye. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click a like below, leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already. And over that way, there's another video for you to check out. Zypho, out.